Welcome to module four. We're gonna, uh, the first, obviously the first module is introduction to the course, and then the, the last two modules were about getting involved in ways of getting involved on campus, specifically undergraduate research and student organizations, which is really important for a career. So hopefully that was informative, and some of you maybe already know a lot of the, about that. Um, we're gonna switch gears for the next uh, few, probably four modules. And we're going to start focusing on part of bioskills that is what I call the kind of the studying and learning part of it. So obviously getting involved and doing things towards your career goals is really important. But at the end of the day, um, grades are the most important. That's why you're in college. It's really important to get good, good grades. But even more than that, it's important to learn how to learn. So in that very first video, um, do you know or what does it all mean or, you know, the or did you know, uh, where they, they showed you a bunch of facts about where biology is going, or where, where life is going, essentially, with tons of information. There's too much information to memorize. So the question is, what information do you need to know in order to be a lifelong learner? And how do you, as an individual, learn the best, and what are some ways that you can maximize your learning? So let me tell you, again, the motto of BioSkills is I want to save you time. Um, and this is part of saving you time. I want you to try and learn some strategies that will make your studying more efficient. So you can actually study shorter but learn more um, as opposed to you know someone pulling an eight-hour cram session. They might not be learning as much as you might think. Um, I want to save you money because every time you have to repeat a course or take extra courses, it costs you money. All right? <clears throat> and I want to help you get the career that you want. And most of the careers in biology, unfortunately, require good GPAs. And so um, in order to get at that, it's important to understand first how you learn. And so today's topic is going to be about how people learn. Um, and I'm going to show you everything I'm showing you and everything I'm, I'm going to tell you about in the next few modules is based on peer-reviewed scientific literature. These are psychologists and sociologists and people who have studied this. And we do know a lot about how the brain works. And you can use that to your advantage. Okay, so how do you learn? And so you can see this, this diagram here. You have someone maybe reading something on a, on a computer screen, and you're I ideally what you need to do is convert that to long-term memory so that you can remember it forever, hopefully. And so the question is, how does that happen? And you have to remember there's lots of ways that we learn through senses, through hearing, seeing, touching, and so on. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually ask you a question, and you don't have to write this down or anything, but, um, oh, I think it's part of your homework, actually. I made up homework question number one. Um, so you can you can pause and do your homework question number one if you want, um, or or you can just answer this now. Um, and the question is, how do you know you know something? So if I let's say we have an exam next week, you have an exam in a really hard course, so bio one or some kind of biology course you're taking. How do you know you're ready for that exam? How do you know you know the information? What you know what tells you that you actually understand the material? And so take a minute and think about that. Maybe jot it down in a notebook somewhere. Pause the video and think about it because that one question is kind of the fundamental answer to uh, being successful in classes and in school. It's how do you make sure you know before you take the test. Many students will say they know they know something whether they get it right or wrong on a test. And although that is true, my goal is to help you figure out to, to assess this before the test because that's too late. If you get it wrong in the test, you've already lost points. I want you to try and figure out whether or not you know something before the test comes. So much of what I'm going to tell you uh, is coming from a book called How People Learn, uh, which was uh, put together by the National Research Council in 2009. And they had three major findings. I'm only going to talk to you about two of them today. And they basically said people learn the best or they'll learn the most amount of information the most efficiently when they can build both a deep foundation of factual knowledge, but they have to combine that with a very strong conceptual framework. And we'll talk about what those terms mean, but I know you've heard your professors over and over again say, I want you to focus on the concepts while they throw a bunch of facts at you. And many times we're more concerned about the facts all these different pieces of information than we are about what they actually mean and how they're related to each other. So I'll focus on that in a little bit. And then the third major finding <clears throat> is um, in order for students to learn better, students need to enhance their ability to monitor their own learning. So that question, how do you know you know something? 
That ability is, has a really fancy word and it's called metacognition. And what that means is your ability to, to think outside of your brain, to assess whether your brain actually knows something or not. Okay, and we'll talk about more of, uh, more of that as well. So let's go back to the first thing. They said, you will learn the, the longest. Things that you will remember long term are when you can incorporate facts into an already existing conceptual framework. All right, and so uh, I want to show you a couple examples of what that really means. So um, <clears throat> in every single person's head, you have a conceptual framework regarding a certain subject. And there's another fancy word for that conceptual framework, and that's called schemas. So schemas are how you, uh, your framework exists in the world. So for example, you wake up in a bedroom, uh, you have a conceptual framework that there's going to be four walls, a ceiling, probably a bed, um, and whatever else is in your bedroom. And so obviously, if that conceptual framework is changed, um, you have to address that and figure that out, right? So your schema can change, so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a bunch of facts. So don't write this down, just kind of listen to this, and imagine this is like a quiz or like a, a class you're taking. Okay, so here we go. John walked on the roof, Bill picked up the egg, Pete hid the axe, Jim flew the kite, Frank flipped the switch, Alfred built the boat, Sam hit his head on the ceiling, Adam quit his job, Jay fixed the sail, Ted wrote the play. Okay, so I just read you about 10 facts, and this is no different than you facts you would hear in a lecture. We don't know who these characters are yet. Uh, we do know what the subjects are, so roof, egg, axe, and so on. So you get to a test, and what does a test say? Who built the boat, right? Now, obviously, if you had time to study, you could probably memorize these, but try to think off your head who built the boat. Who picked up the egg? All right. Who quit the job? Who hit the ceiling? Who wrote the play? Who flipped the switch? Who hid the axe? Who flew the kite? And who fixed the sail? Okay, so off the top of your head, I'm sure you didn't hardly, could, could, could hardly remember any of those. If I gave you a day to study these and take flashcards, my guess is you could actually memorize them all pretty easily. But what, would be, what if I gave you that exact same quiz about a week later without you studying again, you would forget them. Okay, and so things are easier to remember. These facts are meaningless unless we can fit them into a conceptual framework. So let me go back and read you another list. Santa Claus walked on the roof. The Easter Bunny picked up the axe. George Washington hid the axe. Benjamin Franklin flew the kite, Thomas Edison flipped the switch, Noah built the boat, Michael Jordan hit his head on the ceiling, Richard Nixon quit his job, Christopher Columbus fixed the sail, William Shakespeare wrote the play. Okay, so who built the boat? Noah. Who picked up the egg? The Easter Bunny. Who quit the job? Richard Nixon. Who hit the ceiling? Michael Jordan. So I gave you facts. These are people that you already know about because they're already in your own conceptual frameworks. You know all of these from childhood or from high school or from wherever you first learned them. And so science, is, is, science classes are like this. Unfortunately, the problem is in many science classes, you don't have the conceptual, you're trying to build a framework and at the same time, you're trying to take the facts and fit them into the framework. And that's extremely difficult. And that's why science courses can be so difficult. So when professors say to really focus on the conceptual framework, they're trying to help you. They're trying to say, to show you how are all these things related? What do these facts really mean in terms of a broader system? Because then it's much easier to remember facts. And in fact, what will happen is as you get into more senior classes, so a lot of times you might find that those advanced courses are actually a little bit easier than what you remember your intro courses to be. And that's because you have a conceptual framework now that you can put a lot, of more, a lot more facts into. All right. So that's what we mean by a conceptual framework. It's a, it's a schema. It's something that you understand how things work. And once you understand how things work, I can give you extra information about them, and you can actually remember them more uh, or remember them better than if you were just learning the, con the concept as well. So be aware of that. And whenever you study and you focus in classes, um, obviously there are exceptions to this rule depending on the type of course. But most science courses, you need to focus on the concept. And if you don't, it makes that it makes learning that much harder. Here's another example, and this is classic for kind of a biology example. So this is a, a parts chart for something. You know, it's got lots of diff different parts, and it shows that you're going to need a screwdriver to put this thing together, whatever it is. 
and the parts all have numbers and you can see a little picture of them and then there's quantities so how many there are and you know you can imagine this is like this is parts of a, of a system or some kind of overall thing and we'll spend the entire 50 minutes of a lecture going through every single part telling you what it does what its function is right and and so you go home and you you learned all these parts and 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 you learned how many they are and how big they are and what's what's their sizes and so on and then when you show up to an exam the exam question instead of asking hey what is part d just like, tell me what part d is the exam question says how is the function of this overall structure altered if part cc breaks all right so if you go back to the list part cc is a small screw uh, 4.5 by 16 millimeters probably there's three of them and if you didn't remember or learn what these parts are doing overall in the relationship to each other even though you know what part CC is, you might have a really hard time figuring out well, how, what would happen if part CC breaks. And that's very common in science. We'll tell you tons of facts and then ask you to explain the relationships to each other. This is what the parts list was for. It was for building a bike. <clears throat> and I mean, I'm, I, would, I would assume in this example, your professor would show you this. And then you might. They might say, okay, we're going to talk about all the parts of the bike. Keep in mind that we're talking about a bike. And then they'll spend 45 minutes talking about all the individual parts. And a lot of times you can lose sight of the fact of the overall system that we're talking about. So these are these conceptual frameworks. And fitting these facts, parts of something, into a conceptual framework um, is something that you have to really work hard to do. And, and be aware that the better you get at that, the more practice you, you devote to doing that, the better or the easier it is going to be to learn uh, these, con these, these facts. Uh, it makes learning easier and it actually makes your studying time more efficient. So there's lots of examples like this. And then the How People Learn book, um, they wanted to try to figure out what the difference is between novices and experts. All right? And basically the conclusion is experts notice things, notice features, facts, things, all right, meaningful patterns of information that are basically just not noticed by novices. It's not that experts are smarter than novices. It's essentially that experts are more experienced, right? So a senior student here uh, is more experienced in a lot of classes than a freshman. And typically, seniors do better overall in classes than freshmen do. It's not because they're smarter. It's because they've had four years of classes to learn what to look for, uh, how to uh, identify concepts, kind of how to filter out information. And that's important, and that's the goal for you throughout college, is to figure out how to become an expert. So by the time you graduate, you're, you're basically going to become a lifelong learner because you now understand how to look for information, right? And more importantly, how to filter information out. All right, so building both a deep foundation of factual knowledge. You have to know some facts. More importantly, you have to know where to find facts. But all of those facts are pretty much meaningless unless you can fit them into a, a concept. So... So if, if you and, say, my son both looked at the parts of glycolysis inside of a cell, you would do, probably as a biology major, a much better job of being able to learn that than my son, because my son has no idea even really what a cell is. All right? uh, you have a very under, uh, good understanding of some of those concepts, and so you can fit those facts in. As you advance into more and more uh, advanced coursework, be aware that they're going to be focusing a lot more on adding more and more facts to the same concepts. You have to understand the concepts, though. So if you find certain courses are very difficult, it can be because you're just, you might not be grasping the overall conceptual framework. Uh, and that's when you would definitely want to go to office hours for professors and sit down and say, I don't understand this concept, you know, and try to, try to work through it. All right, the other major finding that I want to focus on is uh, in this book is the best way for students to learn is to enhance students' ability to monitor learning. So metacognition, how do you know you know something? So what's the best way to basically understand how you're learning? All right. <clears throat> and so what I want you to do is pause this video and go to the content section under e-learning and you're going to find a link for from a PDF. And the PDF is, uh, how, is this how I learn or what type of learner are you? Sensory preface, preference self-test. And this is from LSU Center for Academic Success, which is a really good website if you ever want to go look at it for a lot of tips. And many of you maybe have done something like this, but this is a, essentially a test to figure out how you learn. Now, this is not going to require as part of your homework, so if you just want to do this in your head, um, you can. You can kind of pause the video and just do this worksheet as we go through it. 
But on the left hand side are a bunch of questions. So if you could just choose any way to learn, which would you choose, right? Read on your own, listen to a lecture, participate in an experiment, watch a film, or look at diagrams. And I want you to so you have to pick one. So I know many of you might might prefer more than one of these options, but you have to limit yourself to only one. And then when you're done, you want to add up uh, the number of circles of of options you picked in each category. Okay, so you're going to read on your own. So if you highlighted all these, you'd have a six right here, and so on. Okay, so pause the video and go ahead and do that. All right. So on the uh, back of this sheet, if you downloaded it from the homework, essentially what this is trying to assess, and obviously this isn't the most perfect way of doing it, but it's trying to assess what, how do you learn the best? How do you gather information into your brain the most effectively? And it's, you're broken down into essentially four different categories. Now, many of you may be a combination of these, so be, be aware that this is simplified. But some of you are visual learners, so you prefer pictures, charts, diagrams, or graphs. Some people are aural or audio, audio learners, so prefer hearing information or even talking about the information to yourself. Some of you uh, mainly prefer to read and write. You, don't, you do much better by just writing and, and reading things. And then some people are what are called kinesthetic learners, and these are people who prefer hands-on activities or movement or touching things to, to learn things. And on the back of this sheet, and I'm going to summarize some of this later in the later slides, but this is a really helpful sheet if you want to print it out and, and keep it on your wall or something. It gives you some bullet points of ways you can study to basically um, target how you best learn. So for example, if someone's a visual learner, rewriting your notes isn't going to help you too much because that would affect, that's good for writing and reading learners. But in class, if you underline important points, highlight with different colors, maybe draw things yourself if you can. While you're studying, don't rewrite your notes, modify your notes. You're going to really uh, highlight things, rearrange images and so on, and try and put things into a visual representation of what you need to know. And then on the right, is I, I like this chart a lot because it tells you things that you can actually do during your exams, while you're taking an exam, to kind of trigger your learning practices. So during an exam, you can recall a picture, maybe draw on the exam the picture that you remember drawing, and that might help you. Um, you can dump formulas and diagrams. Many of you do this already, where when you get the test immediately, you just start writing out the um, formulas that you've memorized so that you can get them on the page and so on. So where, regardless of what type of learner you are, definitely use this chart to really help you. But let me show you a couple um, key tips. Visual learners do, uh, do very well by trying to visualize relationships and how things, um, how facts fit into place. So if you can summarize parts of your text or part of your notes with a picture, um, visual learners do really well at that. So people who say that they have a photographic memory um, might not have a photographic memory, but they're visual learners. They, they can remember pictures a lot easier. And if you can remember the picture, you can actually remember the, the information that's in those pictures. Um, but here's one that I, I love doing with my students, and I would highly recommend you trying if you're a visual learner, and this is called a concept map. And this is for um, a bunch of terms that are for glycolysis, or actually basically all of cellular respiration. And a concept map means you take all the key terms, so cytoplasm, glucose, pyruvate, so on, and you put them in circles. And then the goal is to show relationships by linking the two um, facts with some kind of connecting information. Usually it's a verb. So for example, glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. Uh, glycolysis produces NADH. Glycolysis makes pyruvate, which turns into acetyl-CoA. So this is what this is doing for visual learners is it's, it's allowing them to visualize spatial relationships between um, facts. And for them, they can learn a lot better by this method. Um, and so this is a really nice method. Many um, professors do this in class, but if you've ever tried it um, when you're studying, it's a really good way to study. And get, just get a, a dry erase board and just draw over and over again different concept maps. And you'll actually remember them in your head, so when you come to an exam, you can remember some of the relationships. Audio learners <clears throat> do best when they can hear the lecture over again, so a lot of times they'll record a lecture and listen to it while they're in the car or, or on headphones. Many audio learners prefer to study in groups as well because they can talk to each other and listen from someone or um, they can help explain and teach others. And what's happening when you're teaching others is you're hearing yourself talk. So um, that's why it's an audio type learning style. 
So if you don't like study groups, maybe you don't have anyone to study with, but you do, you do learn better from that method, one thing you can do is actually take a concept that you're trying to learn and get a tape recorder or get, get your phone you know, and record. Essentially read it, explain it. Explain it to like your imaginary friend. Explain it to someone on the phone. And then play it back. And so you're doing two things. You're, saying, you're talking out loud, so you're hearing yourself talk. All right? But a lot of times you might not catch mistakes when, you, when you're talking. And then when you're listening to yourself talk, you can really start to catch whether you explain that properly, whether that sounded right or, or incorrect or so on. And so the example I give for this is giving directions to someone. So if someone says, hey, can you tell me where you know, the, the McDonald's is near your house? You might be able to, you know where it is. You can visualize it. You even know how to get there. But if I said, give me the directions, give me the street names, and give me the, the points on the compass we're going, so east, west, you know, north, south, um, you, as you're saying it out loud, you actually find out, oh, I don't remember that street. What's that street name again? And you might forget. You know, you might have lived on that street or seen that street for years and years. That can happen. And that's very similar to seeing, being very comfortable with something, thinking you know it, and then what happens is when it comes time for an exam, you have to put it back down on paper and you, you realize you're, you're drawing blanks at certain points. If you practice audio learning like this, where you, you're constantly explaining it out loud or even practice writing it, it really helps to assess whether or not um, you do know it. So metacognition, how do you know you know it? Well, if you can't record it out onto a tape, if you can't explain it out loud, then you probably don't know it as well as you might think you know it. Reading and writing is very similar to audio, except for, for reading, reading and writing learning styles. People, people who do best with these prefer to just write things out instead of explaining them. And that's, this, each one is equally beneficial. They're both really good. Reading and writing, uh, people like to write their notes back out again. A lot of times students will rewrite their notes. One thing I'll say um, a lot is you need to rewrite your notes in your own words. You have to summarize your notes. And in the next couple modules, we'll talk about how to do that. But if you are just copying your notes verbatim, you know, from one notebook to the next, you're not actually doing anything active. And in fact, that's, that doesn't, studies have shown that you don't learn anything by rewriting notes verbatim. You have to rearrange your notes, take a sentence, and then rephrase it. Do something active with that. Uh, many people like to answer practice questions in writing. A, a writing uh, learning style would benefit from getting lots of practice questions and then writing out the answers. An audio learner might just want to say the answer out loud. Right? So very similar. But Practice questions are good, and even if your professor doesn't give you a practice exam, if you use Google and Google like, hey, Bio 1 glycolysis exam, you'll find lots of example questions online, and just use those and start practicing um, answering some of those questions. And we'll, we'll talk more about d doing that when we talk about testing, taking tests. For kinesthetic learner, many kinesthetic learners do better by lab. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, you actually probably prefer to, to learn in a laboratory than you like, prefer a lecture because you can actually work hands-on with the concept that you're working on or that you're trying to learn. Um, many kinesthetic learners need to be moving around in order to learn. So a lot of times they'll, they'll go for a walk while they're listening to a lecture or they'll pace in their room while they're reading something, and that's very normal. Um, and... So you can do that. A lot of kinesthetic learners um, associate things they learn with personal examples. So if it's something abstract, like a glycolysis, you can't really see it and you can't feel it. But if you try to imagine certain processes like glycolysis as parts of your house, all right, so the cytosol is your living room and inside the cytosol is a, you know, a sofa or whatever, all right, a kinesthetic learner does really well with that because they can envision that, um, those tactile things. One caveat that that handout tells you is that for kinesthetic learners, you're not going to be allowed to move around a room when you're taking an exam. So it is important to every now and then study in exam-like environments so that you can kind of help uh, train your body to, to, to sit still while you are thinking. All right, so here are some examples of um, different learning styles. And so <clears throat> you might not have realized this, but it's really important to actually study and, and do things that will target your learning style. You will learn faster and easier that way. If you prefer to l listen to things, and yet all you're doing is rewriting your notes, that might not be the most effective way. You might want to actually read your notes out loud into a tape recorder and then listen to them back and then so on. So, so try, uh, the important thing is to try different, different techniques that are going to target your style. 
All right, so um, here's a paper. Now it's relatively old, but it's, it's still relevant. And we're gonna switch gears a little bit away from how people learn and focus more on um, something that you're gonna do for your homework, something that's gonna come up when you're doing a reading assignment for your homework. And that is that there are different types of learners as well. So there's different types of styles of learning, but then there's different ways that you that students will learn. And these aren't as cut and dry, so be aware that this is these are very complex. But essentially, psychologists gave a group of students an article and asked them to read it. And then afterwards, the students were interviewed to discuss how they read the article. And of course, they were assessed and, and so on as well. And this one paper, and there's many, many other papers that talk about this, um, found that students will actually fall into three basic categories when they study. And those categories are surface learners, uh, deep learners, and strategic learners. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about these three. And, and not everybody falls into this all the time. So for example, you can be a surface learner and a deep learner in the same semester, probably just in different classes maybe. All right, but be aware that there's these type of behaviors that are also governing your learning. So surface learners are people who basically only focus on passing the exam. They don't really care whether they learn it or not. They don't care about, you know, for the next class or their career. They're just taking this course. I just need to pass the exam. Now, that can happen. Sometimes we take courses where we really don't are not interested in, and all we are focusing on is passing the exam. And so what will happen is surface learners are looking for just facts and words they can memorize. They're trying to just anticipate any questions someone might ask them and then find the fastest way to uh, memorize something that's going to allow them to get the question right. So they're only doing, uh, oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that, that was an update. But So they're only doing um, surface learning. So they're only looking at the surface of a topic. All right, and the, the problem with this, this can work actually for certain courses. And many of you maybe have been like this, and I know I have. The problem with this is surface learners actually tend to focus on unimportant details, and they actually miss these major concepts. And a lot of times they're memorizing facts that are completely meaningless and not even part of the overall topic. And so if you've ever gone to an exam and you almost feel like the exam questions are being asked about something you didn't even know about, like you didn't even study, go back and go to the notes and compare the exam with the notes and look at that and look at what you're actually studying. It's possible you were focusing on just really surface level facts and you kind of missed the point. Um, now, maybe not always, but, but that can happen. If that's the case, definitely go find your instructor and say, I missed this completely. What's going on? Um, and try to move beyond surface. So in, in, in biology, you have to move beyond the level of a surface learner because the courses are much too difficult to just try and memorize only certain facts. You have to put them into a conceptual framework. Then there are deep learners, like the, the basically the polar opposite of deep learners. These are people who actually care very deeply about the stuff that they're learning. They want to understand the meaning behind what they're reading. Not only do they want to know the facts, but they want to know why are they why are the facts this way. So if you've ever read something and go, I'm really curious about why it is this way, you're becoming a deep learner, and that's a really good um, habit to have. They're trying to take relationships and or implications and applications. So they're trying to think about what does this mean for this system, or, or what's the point of this in this overall chapter talking about. And they're trying to distinguish between evidence and conclusions. So they're trying to look for evidence for why the textbook is saying something or why a paper they're reading is saying something. All right. So deep learners are kind of what, where we want all of our students to be by the time they graduate. We want them to basically have a very deep understanding and a passion to, to delve deeper into material. And by the time you become a senior, you will become a deep learner because you, you're going to start to relate previous knowledge to new knowledge. Oh, I remember I learned that, that topic in genetics, and now we're seeing it again in physiology. Okay, that, this makes sense. That's, you know, so you're, you're taking new knowledge and fitting them into an existing conceptual framework. So if you are an introductory student and you're taking Bio 1 and Bio 2 right now, you might not be at this level yet because you're basically trying to learn conceptual frameworks. You're trying to build the framework to begin with. But as you advance from those courses, your goal is to become a deep learner. You want to start relating knowledge from different courses into the same conceptual framework. And this will make each successive um, course that you're taking actually easier because you're, you're trying to really understand the meaning behind all of these, these facts that you're learning. So the key for deep learners is emphasis is internal. 
all right? And so uh, it's from within you, and, and it's not just a pressure. It's not like you just want to pass this exam. It's you really want to understand this material, all right? So this takes time, though. So be aware that if you're taking a full load in a semester, and um, you, I know you probably really do care about the material, at some point you have to also compromise and say, I need to learn this in about a week because my exam's coming up in a week. So this takes balance. You've got to really have good time management to um, become a deep learner. But be aware that this should be your goal. Right, if you're not already there yet. And then in between surface learners and deep learners are strategic learners. And strategic learners, <clears throat> um, they primarily intend just to make good grades. They don't, they're not, they don't necessarily care about the material, although some of them might, but they really just want to make good grades. Often, you know, you'll hear this phrase, and, and I, won't, I don't agree with this, but you'll hear it said that strategic learners are these pre-med mentality, the pre-med students, who are just doing this just to get into med school. Now, I don't believe that's true because I'm, I have talked with many of our, our pre-med students and they honestly have a passion for biology and they really do want to learn it. But you may meet some people who are like that. Oh, I don't really care about this course, but I know I need to take this in order to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and that can, that can make someone fall into becoming a strategic learner. And so a lot of times they actually will get high marks. Many studies have shown that strategic learners actually do get good grades. Um, However, what will happen is they don't have any long-term retention. So they look like deep learners, but they're not. They're, they, so they're, they're kind of a, they're strategic learners, essentially. What they do is they, strategic learners will focus almost exclusively on how, how to find out what the professor wants and how to ace the exam. So it's not they are learning the material, but not from an internal emphasis. They're learning it because they just want to ace the exam. Now, if you do this, strategic learning, you probably will actually end up learning the material because most exams are going to assess your knowledge of material. So it's not their, they're not saying that this is a bad thing. What they're saying is that this can, this can get you in trouble though, is, is at some point in certain courses and careers, you have to move beyond strategic learning to get into deep learning. All right, and your homework assignment is going to have you read a little bit more about these types of learners and give some examples, which will help you out. Oh, here it is. Okay, so this is um, essentially all I have for this top module. So it's actually kind of a short module. Um, but your homework assignment is a little bit longer, so we'll, we'll balance that out. Your homework assignment is to read a chapter out of a book called What the Best College Students Do. And this is a book written by an author called, named Ken Bain. And here's a picture of the book. Uh, the chapter itself is on e-learning. Under the content page, uh, it'll say, it's a PDF that says Chapter 2 what the best college students do. Um, it's relatively, it's not too long, but it's a really easy read. It's, it's, a, it's nice. And, and basically what, what he did, and I'm gonna kind of talk you through this so I can explain what the homework is. What he did is he interviewed a bunch of very successful people. Um, and he wanted to know what was their college like that made them mo most successful. And I'll give you the conclusion of the book. Basically, what he found out was that many of them didn't have the best GPAs. Many of them kind of didn't even know what they wanted to do for their life yet. But many of them had a, a fundamental curiosity, something that they were very passionate about and interested in in college that they wanted to figure out. And it was that curiosity that led them down the path that they were in. Many of you, I read your, um, your first homeworks, have a fundamental curiosity in biology. You have a very good passion about what you're interested in. And so what I want to try and get you to focus on is what can you do to really feed that passion and what are some things that you still want to get done in college that we can help you with? And so the homework I have for you is called Who Am I? Questions in College. And I'm going to have you kind of, you have to read the chapter and tell me a little bit about the people you read about. So you have to pick one person who, who you identify with um, and explain why and so on. But the bottom part of the homework is what I really want uh, you to think about. And it basically says, what are three questions that you want answered in college? And they can be anything. Um, it, it, they can be, why is the sky blue? Uh, why, why is uh, the ocean oxygenation, or oxygen percentage a certain percentage or so, which I don't know. But what, you know, what, just think about anything that you would like answered in a class um, or even in life. So you know, um, what am I going to do with my life or something like that? And the reason I have you do this assignment, we're not going to share it or discuss it or anything like that, is it gets you to think about yourself, your own motivations, and more importantly, it gets you to think about what can I do to answer this, 
All right, so college is a great time because you're in an area that has lots of courses you can take, lots of mentors available to you to help you figure these things out. But if you don't know what the question is that you need to figure out, you don't know where to go first, all right? Um, if you already know your career goal, that's, that's awesome, and there's lots of things we can do to help you with that. But what about your career goal is something that you're still not sure about? So if you're interested in medicine, you know, why do people get sick? What is cancer? You know, those are the questions um, can really help you move to become a deep learner, right? So hope, I hope when you read this chapter, you also realize um, that, that this book, this chapter is trying to move you into becoming deep learners and move you away from a surface learner, right? And that way you're going to learn a lot more in your classes, which will make each next class uh, that much easier. The assignment is a Word document, and as usual, you can submit that to the Dropbox. The chapter, you don't have to, you don't have to submit. The styles of learning um, handout, you don't have to submit either. So the only thing you have to hand in is your homework number four um, document. All right, and again, again, it can be PDF or Word. Um, as you notice on e-learning, um, the, the, these videos are now uploaded to YouTube, and they're linked to e-learning through the YouTube channel. So you can watch them in either space. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're about four modules in now. We have, we're about a, th a fourth of the way through the, through the course. And uh, please let me know if there's any technical issues or anything that, that's going on with the course. Um, and I'll try my best to address it.